We uh, we live in Fort Payne, which is down in the gully, and only we live up on the other mountain. So Jack and I got the mountains in Alabama covered. He's over here on Sand Mountain, and I'm over there on Lookout Mountain, and we can holler across the gully. People in Mentone call Fort Payne the ditch because it's down there on flat land. That's never, it's not flat, but people in Mentone think it's flat. Anyway, you can turn to Philippians chapter 3, I'm sorry, 2, Philippians chapter 2, and uh, just a word about things being bigger in Texas. What was bigger was what it was going to cost to stay out there. Now, it was a interesting choice to make and took a long time to make it and uh, lots of factors. Nevertheless, uh, when we moved to Alabama in 1973 from Danville, Illinois, we fell in love with Alabama and lucky for us, our oldest son moved to Mentone five years ago and we kept, every time we come east, we'd wind up at his house and and we liked it up there, so when the choice was to leave Texas, we couldn't find any place we liked any better. We looked at uh, several different areas, two or three different states, and it turned out to be Northeast Alabama. I think the Lord may be the only one who knows why, but it was. That was just the best choice for us to do. Um, and... You know, the, the Curries are here, and they allow me to come see them once a month or sometimes twice a month down at Alexandria, and um, I love going down there. You know, Jack and I first heard Brother Moore in Anniston, and I find it ironic 42 years later that I'm going down there to, to teach Bible classes. But anyway, uh, that was a, a great privilege to, to be invited to come down there and talk to them whenever they need me. Um, I want to talk to you tonight about uh, some things that, that are found here in the book of Philippians. And you know, it always has, for years it seemed to me like the best thing you could do in teaching Philippians is to start early one morning and don't stop except for food and restroom and water and just keep teaching. You should never interrupt this book. And Jack told me I only had four and a half hours, so I can't do it. Sorry about that. Anyway, um, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure nobody would. Could you leave the lights on for me? Uh, but anyway, there's some things about the, the book of Philippians that I find absolutely astounding. And I believe that uh, uh, I, not, not everybody would have to agree with me. It wouldn't matter to me if anybody argued about this. But I believe that if you take Paul's ministry from Acts chapter 9 all the way to Acts chapter 28, and then in prison, in Acts chapter 28, I believe he wrote Philippians first. <clears throat> and that doesn't work. Okay, here we go. There we go, it's black. And I believe that he wrote Philippians first from prison. And it, you know, like I said, I don't think that's a big deal, but nevertheless, that's kind of the way I see it. And I think the reason he wrote Philippians is because he was writing to a bunch of Jews that got saved by the gospel of Christ in Acts chapter 16. And they needed to know something about what he was going to reveal. And he tells them some amazing things. And the interesting thing to me is that today, we look at religion around us, no matter what the name tag it is on there, and we can see the same problems that Paul was telling these people they were going to see. Like, for instance, in chapter 2, in verse 14, he says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life. Think about this. Here's a bunch of people, most likely Jews, who had the word of life, that which would save anybody that would hear him, listen to him, and they had this, and he said to hold it forth, just after telling them that they were that they're living in a crooked and perverse nation. Well, I wonder how that matches where we live. I mean, for crying out loud, 
How, I don't even know if you could get as crooked and perverse as we are in this world, in this nation, this hemisphere, whatever you want to call it. You know, they, they're going to shine as lights in the world because they're going to talk about the gospel of Christ. And it's like Paul says, you know, this is what you're going to do. I, don't, I reckon they did it. I don't know. But the point is, if you look at where they came from, Acts chapter 16, he first went into Europe, and, they, and then he writes back to them after he gets in jail. Acts uh, 14, 13, 14, and Acts 17 and 18, he wrote to them before he went to prison. He wrote to them before Acts chapter 20. Not these people. He doesn't write to them until he gets into prison. And then he writes to them about a crooked and perverse nation. Literally, I think he's talking about the, the fact that they were Jews, but that's just my opinion. But my point about it is, they had what these people needed, just like we've got what people need now. If we tell people the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation, they can get saved. If we don't tell them, who you reckon's going to? Shall we send them down to the first name church on the corner? The one with the tallest steeple? Or the one with the biggest gymnasium? What are we going to do here? We're going to tell people the gospel of Christ. How that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. And let me tell you something. There has never been better words to use to come out of your mouth. I don't care what you're talking about. There's never been better words to come out of your mouth. I've seen it stop fights. Just saying the words of the gospel of Christ. Has Percy ever told you about the guy that came in the... the uh, Mission down there in Mobile with the knife on. <laughs> That's a funny story. But anyway, we, he got stopped because he was confronted with the Bible, didn't he? He just stopped where he was, sat down. And the whole point is not power. I mean, the power is in the Word of God, holding forth the Word of life. Well, he told these people to do that. And he says, you're do, you're going the, the positive side of Paul here is he's telling them they're going to. Among whom ye shine as lights in the world. So they got on with it, I reckon. Now, with that as a background, that little spot right there, people sitting in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, the sons of God without rebuke, you know, we don't have any. What's God mad at us about? Absolutely nothing. What's God going to chastise us for? Absolutely nothing. Isn't that something? When you were growing up, did you ever think you'd be living like that? <laughs> Most of the time I thought it was constant. No, listen folks. Blameless, harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. What a position. So, over in chapter 3. He says, Finally, my brethren, <clears throat> rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Now if I look back at the time frame of Christ here on the earth, or the time frame of the apostles in the first part of the book of Acts, that verse doesn't match those people. But this verse matches the Philippians, just because they were saved by the gospel of Christ, just like it matches us today. We are the circumcision, I believe they literally were, and they are different than the rest of the circumcision. These people worship God in the Spirit. They obeyed the Lord. And they rejoice in Christ Jesus. They don't deny Him like most of the Jews did in those days. And they have no confidence in the flesh. Do you know why the rest of Israel had confidence in the flesh? Because they'd been told to for 1,500 years. And when Christ told them that the flesh profits nothing, they wanted to kill Him. Well, they were told that they were going to live in a land that they didn't 
They didn't uh, choose. They're going to live on property they didn't uh, cultivate. They're going to live in houses they didn't build. And on and on and on. They had every confidence that everything was coming their way. And they didn't even pay any attention to the putridness of the priesthood and how far it got away from what it was called to do. But they still had confidence in the flesh. And when Jesus told them that God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth, they got mad at that. And then He, and then he told them that the flesh profits nothing and they got mad at that. And they denied the Lord and killed Him. said, we have no king but Caesar. It's a funny thing to me, by the way, speaking of having no king but Caesar, it's a funny thing to me that there are people in the world who believe that they rightly divide the word of truth. And they say that Acts chapter 7 is the fall of Israel and that they diminished and were cast away at the same time. That's pretty weird. There wasn't a Gentile saved in Acts chapter 7. Through the fall of Israel, salvation came unto the Gentiles. There wasn't a Gentile saved there. Not even close. In fact, you can't even find a Gentile being dealt with until you get to Acts chapter 11. So people say, I've had people jump up at me and there and they say, well, you're saying it was at the cross. And I say, yes, I am. And they say, well, nobody got saved at the cross either. Well, we all got saved by the cross, didn't we? I mean, there's come, there is some application. My point about all that is, these people worshiped God in the Spirit and rejoiced in Christ Jesus. That must have been some trip into Europe. Basically, I mean, he stopped a couple other places, but Paul and his company, Paul and Luke and Titus and Silas, Timothy, they stop at Philippi and they found people who would rejoice in Christ Jesus. That is really something. That's amazing. I reckon it is. Amazing grace. They, they worship God in the Spirit. They rejoice in Christ Jesus. And they put no confidence in their flesh. That's a drastic change from the Jews they were in the past and the Jews they knew. All of their relatives. All of their heritage. They all put confidence in the flesh. These people learn not to. They learned what Paul was writing to, or telling them when he was there. And then he writes back to them and puts it in words. And it's like, like I said, I'm, I may foul it up here, but it's just like a continual flow of things for them to see. I mean, look in chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What a thing to say. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know what always gets me about that verse? Everybody is. Everybody is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the question is, are you going to do that now? Or are you going to do that later? Everybody's going to. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess. Well then, it would seem to be a whole lot easier now than say at the great white throne judgment. And a little more difficult there, doesn't it? I mean, it won't be diff more difficult for you to have a bended knee and a bowed head. Sure ain't going to be easy to admit who He is. You know, when I talk to people about just simply bring up the Lord to them, Sometimes I want to stop and back up and say, wait, 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 wait. Which Lord are you talking about? So sometimes I don't recognize Him. Not too long ago, I asked a woman if, uh, if she was saved and she said, I am the Lord's woman. I said, how's that working out for you? And uh, she, said, she didn't have the foggiest idea whether she had lost or saved. 
So I said, do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know the grace and truth that came by the Lord Jesus Christ? And she just looked at me. She never answered either question. I said, was there ever a moment, a day, a time in your life that you can recall where you simply gave up on yourself and put your faith in Jesus Christ for what He did for you? And she folded her hands across her front like this and said, what did He do for me? So I told her, oh yeah, 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 she says. I don't believe, you know, you could be saved and be that flippant, but I think it would be a hard thing to be. I don't know about that. I'm pretty sure even she's glad I'm not judging her about her salvation. But the point I'm making is, what about that Lord? Who is that Lord? Well, Paul been preaching this Lord Jesus Christ and the power of God unto salvation since Acts chapter 9. And now he's writing to the Philippians. Look what he says about the Lord. Notice he says in chapter 3, Verse, start with me in verse 7. But what things were gained to me, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Now, I don't believe Paul had written Ephesians and Colossians at this time, nor 2 Timothy. Think about 2 Timothy chapter 3. I don't believe he had written those words down, but I believe he knew them. I believe he had all the revelation by the time he wrote the book of Philippians. And he says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. You know, the excellency of the knowledge sometimes is hard to claim. We can read it. But we walk away and we can't recall it or we walk away and we after we walk away from a conversation, we think, oh, I should have said this. Oh, I should have said that. Look what Paul says about himself. He says, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, middle of verse 8, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him. He's been preaching Him for 30 plus years at this time. That I may know Him. It's an excellent knowledge. And it's excellency in the knowledge of Christ Jesus. And He says that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. I remember one of the first Bible camps I went to, probably the second year, which would have been 75, I guess. I, I remember Brother Moore preaching on this passage, and I wondered, what, is it, what, did, what would Paul mean when he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death? I knew I was a dummy and having to learn some things about this, but why would Paul say that, that I may know him? And then it dawned on me sometime later, maybe by something else that Brother Moore was preaching about it. Look back, if you will, hold on to Philippians 3. Look back in Galatians 2. Galatians 2. <clears throat> I appreciate the uh, use of pronouns here. When Paul was talking to Peter in verse... Uh, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. It's we. We, 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 we. But then when he starts telling the Galatians why he said what he said and did what he did and was where he was, it's I. He's only accountable to the Lord Himself. He was accountable to the Lord for what he said to Peter, but he's not accountable for Peter. Look at this. For if I build, verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. Man, that goes a long way toward Philippians 3, verse 10. 
Keep reading. For I through the law am dead to the law that I may li might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Not I was, not I want to be, not I should be, not I intend to be. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. How could He live like that? He knew the Lord. He knew the Lord that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection. You know, if you understand that you were crucified with Christ and yet you live, then you know the power of His resurrection. One of these days, something about this body, I know you think it's beautiful, something about this body is going to quit. I kind of like the way our dad died. He's standing at Walmart, checkout counter, buying a bottle of vitamin E. I think that's a great heritage, right? And boom, down he went. Great way to go. Not a lot of people go like that. I don't know if any of you ever sit around thinking about stuff like that. But, you know, after a while you get so it comes across your mind every now and then, right? You see, the point is, when we die, when this flesh dies, whatever that is, it magnifies that verse in Galatians 2. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I couldn't have said, before I found out about rightly dividing, I couldn't have said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. I couldn't have said that. I could tell you when I got saved, and knew I was saved, talked to people about it, and whatever. Didn't say the right words, obviously. I was a damn just... And didn't know about what I should have been saying. But I never would have understood dying. I never would have understood being crucified with Christ. I probably sang songs that had it in it, but still didn't understand it. But when you find out that your apostle has just got through straightening out one of the twelve apostles and something he was doing and wound up explaining to these Galatians, I am, he didn't say we are crucified with Christ, he said I am. And when he didn't say we, he wasn't going to assume that anybody in Galatia was saved. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I believe that he believed the Galatians were saved. He wasn't trying to co condemn them into, uh, by, by claiming they were lost or anything. But my point is, he don't make the statement that way. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. Well, that's a difficult thing for anybody today to say. You know why? We don't do what Paul did. You know, people say, well, I'm following Jesus. And I'm quick to say, well, I'm following Paul. Oh, yeah? How well am I following Paul? Let's see. I haven't been, nobody's thrown rocks at me for six, seven months. No, I'm just kidding. I've not been left for dead and then get up and go back and preach. And on and on it goes. I follow the doctrine Paul preached. I don't follow Paul. People say they follow Jesus. He said, foxes have holes and birds have nests. The Son of Man hath not where to lay their head, lay his head. And I've said that to people sometimes and say, where are you going to lay your head tonight? What do you mean? What do you mean what I mean? That you said you was following Jesus, you know? All I'm trying to get you to understand is, folks, we follow the doctrine. And we can get this doctrine, the I am crucified with Christ doctrine. And it helps us to know him. Helps us to know Him. I don't know anybody that's arrived to knowing Him. But I know the process. 
that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering, being made conformable unto His death. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. See, if it didn't have that nevertheless part on there, nevertheless I live, I couldn't apply that verse. Not as long as I'm here. I could say I want to be crucified with Christ, but I can say it because I'm living. But the life I live in my flesh is worthless because it's flesh. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. You see, here's the thing. When the faith of Christ was exercised, it was fit. It was fit. I've never been fit. And I knew that part. Look in Colossians 1. I don't guess we're going back to Galatians unless you all have a question. Look in Colossians 1. <clears throat> Start reading with me in verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Tall order. Tall order. Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians has more to say about that than any other single subject. The knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Verse 10. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, look, down, look over at um, uh, chapter 2, Colossians 2. And we'll pick up right smack in the middle of verse 2. The full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. With the term treasures of wisdom and knowledge in mind, go back now to Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Again, verse 8. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. It has everything to do with all wisdom, understanding, and so forth. And it's all, like, it's all here. We've got it all. We've got Genesis to Revelation. We've got Romans to Philemon. And we've got those last seven books. Those last seven books was written while he was in prison. Can you imagine a Christian life today without those last seven books? You know, never was going to happen, of course. But sometimes, when you talk to somebody who thinks that the fall of Israel, fall diminishing and casting away of Israel was like Acts chapter 7, they don't see the need for them. They say, oh no, they take it all. Sure they do, it's in the Bible. It's like they wouldn't throw away the book of Hebrews either, but. They don't see those last seven books for what they're worth. They don't, see what, they don't see what's said there. They don't pay enough attention to what was just ever so slightly different. Too many things going through my head here. Hold on to Philippians and turn to Acts chapter 20. You know, the New King James Bible followed suit with all the other versions of the Bible, when it came out, fouling up this verse. I wrote to a guy, and then I said it to him face to face, not 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 one on one. He was sitting in a place I was preaching. 
about this verse. And I said, if you ever valued grammar, read this verse. And don't stop reading it until you understand it. Verse 24. But none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. The context of this verse is Paul telling some people that he's going to finish his course with joy. He goes on and says, And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Did it say that? No, it didn't. I said to this man, when you read that verse, you're just like the New King James. You put an extra T-O in there. You see, it says to testify the gospel of the grace of God. It does not say to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. They put an extra T-O in there. Most of the versions do that. You know why? Most of them don't even say the gospel of the grace of God totally. I forget how they change it. But they put that extra two in there so that it means that nothing's changed. You go right through the last seven books that Paul wrote and never see a change. Just ignore it. Just take it out. Put a little preposition in there. The devil loves two-letter words. He puts them in, takes them out at his own will, changes them in, of, at, to, by, and on are just interchangeable in his mind, especially if he can cause confusion. King James is very clear. To testify the gospel of the grace of God is to say it for the first time. If you testify to it, you're just attesting that somebody else didn't lie to him about it. You put an extra T.O. in there and all you're doing is testifying like others have. That wasn't what Paul was doing. He was going to go to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And there is a difference. Two-letter words matter. You know, one of the first things that Brother Moore was privileged to teach us was somebody changing two-letter words. And I don't know how many times in Brother Moore's preaching that he would reference Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, but he changed two-letter words. And Brother Moore would catch him every time he did it and tell about it. I thought that was terrific. It taught us. It taught me. Pay attention to what you're hearing. Listen for the, the things they change. But, you know, but, but Barry Hampton started preaching. I was out at his house one night, and he had already told me he was called to preach, and we were having a Bible class out there in Houston, and, and uh, he, he said... Uh, he said, the other day something come up, and I was using this passage here, and he starts reading. I forget where now it was. And, come on, I love Barry. He was a, like a little brother to me. But he just butchered that passage of Scripture all to pieces. And I said, Barry, if you're going to preach, practice reading. I said, stand up and read it out loud to yourself. And listen to yourself. Read. He says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do that. I'll practice. So I didn't go at that time. I was only going to Texas every other week. So two weeks later, I go out there for another Bible class. And they lived in a long, narrow apartment. And, and uh, Jason let me in the front door. And here comes Barry down the hallway with his Bible in his hand. I've been practicing, he says. And you just hear him, right? So he comes up to me and he says, I've been practicing reading. Let me read this to you. And he, I say, he says, I'm going to start in Romans chapter 1. Okay. So he starts reading. He gets down about verse 8 or 9 or something. I said, stop, 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 stop. stop. He says, oh, did I make a mistake? I said, well, Bear, I just want to know, did you want me to stop you when you need to be stopped or do you want to read the whole chapter and then start, have me start over? He said, you mean I did something wrong? He's leaving out two-letter words. It's like he didn't even see them. The most important words in the Bible are two-letter words. That's what puts our sentence structure together. And he was leaving them out in and of and to and by. He's just zooming right past them. He said, well, I didn't know that. And he turns around to Brenda. Like, Brenda, she's got to back him up on this. She said, yeah, you did, Barry. You were. 
But you see, the point was that Barry's mind, he tried to read the same speed his mind was thinking. And he got really good at reading the Bible later. And by the way, he always credited, one of the things he credited that to was singing. You know, you can, I can't do this. Barbara can, she's a sight reader. And she can read the words in a, in a song on a page all at once. I can't. I got to read one. Like that. That's the way I read it. But she can read, you know, she used to show me headlines every now and then. She says, well, look at this. And I said, well, wait, wait, what did it say? She says, what do you mean what did it say? You looked right at it. No. Yeah, but I didn't see it. Well, Barry, did. He, re- he looked that way at a page. And he had to learn how to slow himself down. Slow yourself down. Get it all. Get all the words. Don't leave any out. Say the right things. That's why the Lord put them in there. And people who think the last seven books that Paul wrote are just an addendum tend to do that. They change two-letter words or they leave them out or they wish they weren't there. I don't know what it is. All right. To testify the gospel the grace of God is what Paul did in the last seven books. Do you realize he's in prison? And he didn't go any place that we know of. There is the teaching and probably true that he was out of prison for a little while. Maybe he wrote the book of Titus while he was out of prison. And then he went back to prison. We don't know where else he went. We don't know whether he preached. What we know is what we've got. And that's the last seven books. And when he wrote those last seven books, 2 Timothy chapter 4 says he finished his course. So he testified the gospel of the grace of God. And he said this in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, and it's probable that he had already written those first six books. He's got seven to go, and his job is to finish his course and testify the gospel of the grace of God. Then I know where the gospel of the grace of God's at. It's in the last seven books he wrote. That seems pretty simple to me. Of course, I believe in two-letter words. Look back in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. Let's pick up again in verse 10 just so we can go a little further here. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. I believe that He means there Uh, perfect in the sense of being perfected as in resurrection of the dead. He's not there yet. So he says, but I follow after. In other words, it's there. It's before him. He's following after that. He can't avoid that death. Two, three, four years later, after writing those words, he said, I'm ready to be offered. Which meant he was going to die, I reckon. So he says there, verse uh, 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And yes, there is a prize. And yes, you have the high calling. You know, Jesus said three times under one circumstance or another, The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. That's an overall principle that the Bible lays out. The first ones called to an eternal life are the last ones to get it. The last ones called to an eternal life are the first ones to get it. You and I, when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we became members of the church, the body of Christ, with an inheritance. In fact, there is a reward of the inheritance. There's a prize of the high calling. And we have that first before anybody else has their eternal life reward. The very next thing that happens is the Lord Himself descends from heaven with a shout, voice the archangel the trump of God and the dead in Christ rise first we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up together and meet them in the air meet him in the air and on and on that's first 
It's also the highest, far above all heavens, third heaven or whatever. Put it wherever you want to. It's higher than the other two. Then comes the seven-year tribulation. And the tribulation saints, the kings and priests of Revelation chapter 1, are going to get that city. And when they get that city, it's coming down to the earth. That's second. And then, at that resurrection day, at the end of the seven years, when Jesus stands there and invites those who are alive, come you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, all those from the Old Testament have a resurrection day as well. That's last. Now I suspect there's more divisions than that. But those I can see. That is the way it is. So it's no big deal that we get first. You know why we get first? Because we show forth His glory. We show forth the Lord Jesus Christ's glory forever. Our position as is found in Ephesians 2. We have a seat in heaven that we might show forth the glory of His grace. We're going to show that to the others. And when we do, we had to be there first. We had to be there first. He says, press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you're going to show forth the glory of something, you're going to put it up high. You know, the lights here, they're not down on the floor. And when you go to a star party, I was talking to Jerry and Betty about a star party out of McDonald Observatory out in Texas. You go out there and sit on this hillside and all of the lights at this place are down within about eight or nine inches of the ground. They light the pathways. They don't light the area. And you walk out of this big concrete slab and sit down on a concrete bench and these people take a flashlight and show you stars in the heaven, tell you their names and all that stuff. I, it sounds good to me, but I don't know if they're right or not. But nevertheless, they did all that, pointing a flashlight up into the sky. You know why? It's the darkest place in the United States. So all the stars are seen. If it's a clear night, you can see gazillions of stars. I took account, it's gazillions. The point about that is, that's what they showed. They weren't talking, they weren't showing their path. They weren't showing their benches. The benches were plain old concrete. They weren't showing the beautiful uh, mosaics in, that they built into that little big circle thing out there. They're showing them stars. So here we are, according to Ephesians 2. No need to turn there. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. They're going to see us as the recipients of the riches of His grace, showing forth His glory. And, that, and for them to see us, we have to be the highest up. I'm pretty sure that that don't mean that we outweigh them other eternal lives in any way, shape, or form. That's just what we're used for. So we see, we're seen up there and shows forth the Lord's glory. And by that, the other inheritances can see what their usefulness is. They can see how they fit in. Kings and priests can see how they work out. The new heaven, the new earth, of the increase of His government, there shall be no end. They can see it. They can see how. We're going to light up the sky, folks. So what is Paul talking about? In finishing up here, look at, look at one more thing. Talk too long anyway. Go back to Philippians 1 now. We'll finish up here. He said to them in, in verse, at the end of verse 7, he said, y'all are partakers of my grace. We've got the same grace Paul had. They had the same grace Paul had. Verse 8, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment that you may approve things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, 
which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. That's what we're here for. It's what we're there for. It's what it's what we why we need to learn what God said here and now and what for. This is what we're going to do. Romans 8.29 says we're going to be conformed to the image of God's Son. Once again, we can read about it. We can take it in. We can gather it into our life. Or we can just diddly bop through life. And then one day we'll be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. The thing to remember is that if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, if you know you belong to the Lord, then you've got to know there's a prize attached to it. It's not about how good you are. It's got a lot to do with what you say. So if you say what the gospel of the grace of God is, and if you say what the Lord wants you to say when you regard His Word, then there is a reward of the inheritance. I thank you for your time. appreciate it very much being here.